share a song with you that speaks of the experience they're going to talk about, speaks of the quiet time that we spend with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it's There's a Quiet Place. I have many favorite songs, but that is one of my favorite songs. And these precious young people, when they sing it, every time they sing it, I know it's going to happen. And it does every time. It brings tears to my eyes. And I think, and now I've got to come up here. <laughs> no, but it's, isn't it beautiful? We just really appreciated that. I want to remind you again of what I reminded you of last night, my great burden. You remember what that is that I opened the message with? There is intellectual knowledge, and our heads are full of it, and we say, it's not more intellectual knowledge I need, I need to learn to listen to God's voice. So we leave the intellectual knowledge behind, and we try to hear God's voice, and I want to say to you again, that is two ditches on either side of the straight and narrow. Jesus wants to speak to us through his word. That is his voice. People say to me, I don't hear God's voice. Well, I say, open the word. You'll hear his voice. The more we know what his voice sounds like in the scriptures, the more we will recognize as he brings those principles to our remembrance. This afternoon's message is entitled, Feeding the Soul. And we want to, in this message, we want to point you very clearly to Jesus Christ. you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's turn to Matthew 4 and verse 4. Matthew 4, verse 4. We've just been talking about the meal that we've had and the drowsiness that might follow it. And Matthew 4, verse 4 says this, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So there's more to it than just our physical food that we all know that we need and that we all enjoy. We need to read the word of the Lord together too, don't we? Let's do that now. We're going to ask our daughter Hannah to come and read Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9 for us. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. 
but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Thank you, sweetheart. You know, don't we ordinarily apply this parable to the world out there? And where is the sowing the seeds as Christians into the non-Christian world? And we, we kind of compare what happens to those seeds, don't we? You know, some of them just fall on the stony ground and nothing happens there. And some fall where there's not much depth of earth. And we've all done that, haven't we, with this particular parable? Well, we want to take this parable one step deeper and one step closer to home this afternoon. We would like to apply this parable to our own personal lives, to our own hearts, have that soil be our hearts, and just look at what our hearts are like in our time with the Lord when he comes to sow the seeds in our hearts. A different way of looking at it, but cuts quite deep as we do that. So, open your Bibles there to where Hannah read, Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 3. We're just going to go through it, just verse by verse, applying it to ourselves. And now I don't want you thinking about those that you're reaching out to. This is for us to think about. So apply this personally. In verse 3, Matthew chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Then he spake many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. In Luke, in the parallel verse, it says the sower went out to sow his seed. You know what that's talking about. That is Jesus Christ coming to you in your quiet time to sow seed. You are the soil in this parable. Not your friends, not the person next to you, not your children. It's you. It's me. Verse 4. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. You know what the, way, the wayside is? That's the, you know, back in Bible times, the ground was soft except for where they walked. That was hard. That was the wayside. You know, if any of you plant a garden, you've got the, where the vegetables grow, and then you've got the paths in between. They're hard. So that was the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them, the seeds that were cast onto the wayside. This represents a type of quiet time a type of personal devotion time, where Jesus comes and the wayside does receive the seed. So this is a group of people who are receiving seed. They are having quiet time, okay? But what happens to the seed? It bounces. It doesn't sink in. It doesn't sink in. Does your quiet time sink in? Or does it bounce? You know what I mean? And what happens? It sits on the surface. It doesn't go deep. You see the parallel here? And then what happens to the seed in the parable? The birds come down and peck it up. That is what I call, I I call this experience of quiet time, just doing time. Yes, I was up. Yes, I was there. Did I get anything out of it? Certainly not. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've ever had that experience. I said I wouldn't, because if I did, you'd all have to put your hands up. Okay. (laughs) That has happened to every single one of us, let's be honest. We have just gone through the process of doing time. Christ Object Lessons calls it the inattentive hearer on page 44. It's where we're there. Yeah, praise the Lord, we're there, but... It's not doing us any good. I, this experience is a little bit like, this was a couple of years ago, we were having breakfast together and my wife said, so what did you read this morning, sweetie? I says, yeah, let me, let me tell you. Uh, well, it was just half an hour ago that I finished. <laughs> and what was it I was... Re- <laughs> I couldn't remember. Did that ever happen to you? I mean, the birds came down and pecked it up because I was an inattentive hearer. It just lay on the surface. Yes, I was there, but it didn't do me any good. 
verse 5 there said that some fell on stony places where they did not have much depth of earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth but when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root they withered away as we contemplated that it's a little bit like coming to camp meeting and having certain seeds fall on your heart and getting really enthusiastic are you enthusiastic by the way amen are you going home with a lot of enthusiasm yeah, I am too. It's great, isn't it? But we can go home with all the enthusiasm. We can buy the CDs and we can listen to those and the tapes and the MP3s and anything else. The DVDs. The, the DVDs, yes, yeah, soon. Don't forget the DVDs. <laughs> don't forget the DVDs. <laughs> we can do all of that. But if all you ever do is listen to the rains and the waters and it never becomes your own, it will be scorched up when the heat of trial comes Amen. into your life. And we began to find, it was 12 years ago that we met this ministry, and our lives were incredibly changed as a result of it. But you know, the only way that happened was because after we listened to those messages, we would go home, and rather than just kind of take their word for it, and I hope you will do this too, we went and searched for ourselves. We, got, we didn't even own child guidance in Adventist home back then. It tells you how pitiful it was. We went and bought those and we started reading them and we didn't just find the things they'd shared in the seminars, we found heaps of other things too. And it changed our life because it became our own experience. And you know, one of the things we encountered was, hey, we need to live in the country. We didn't have children at this point, but we still felt a burden from the Lord that we needed to move to the country. And you can see the pictures back there of how the Lord did that. But you know, as we first shared that with some friends and family members, they thought we were nuts. They said, why do you need to go move to the country? And they discouraged it, poured cold water on it. But were we discouraged? We weren't. Do you know why? Because we were deep burying those seeds deep in our own hearts. And it didn't matter what anybody said to us. We knew what the Lord was calling us to do, and we were going to go and do it. And by God's grace, we did. So when you go from this place, you need to make this your own experience. Because if you don't, when you come back next year, you won't be any different than you are right now. You won't be changed. But you know what? If you take it home and it becomes yours, we want to hear about it next year. Because it's going to be really interesting to hear all the different experiences the Lord is giving. It says in verse 7, Matthew 13, we're still there, verse 7, it said, And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. So this is people, this is either you or I, in our quiet time, we've received the seed and it's starting to grow, but then something comes that stops the growth. Maybe the cares of this world, they start getting tangled up in the cares of this world, or the desire for riches, or the issues, the issues of the world or the issues of the church. You know, I had one lady come to me one day, we were traveling, our family and this lady were traveling to a location. She said, I've had a wonderful quiet time and I've got to share it with you. I was very interested. So we're driving to wherever we were going, I don't recall, and she says, let me run this by you. When Jesus was crucified, the blood rolled down his arms and down his body and down his legs and down the cross and it went through a crack in the rock and it landed on the literal Ark of the Covenant that was under the ground. Isn't that interesting? Well, did it? Didn't it? I don't know. But is that really going to help me? Is, is that really going to help me in my day ahead? Would that help you? It was exciting. It was interesting, but of no practical value. Don't let your quiet time become the time that you use to sort out all the issues. It is the time to connect with Jesus Christ. The good news is, on, in verse 8, it says, but other, other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Amen. That's the group we want to be in. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. If you want to avoid being the wayside or the shallow ground or the, the thorns, you have to make quiet time meaningful. It's a precious, it's an appointment with God every day. We're going to look at four aspects of quiet time. When to have it, personal time, morning devotions, whatever name it is that it is in your house. 
Then we're going to look at who needs it. Maybe if you listen up and don't nod off, <laughs> you listen. Maybe you'll find you're exempt. Is that right? Could there be somebody that might be exempt? Well, you better listen up and find out. <laughs> we're going to look at what the purpose of quiet time is, and then some practical how-tos of quiet time. So if I ask you this question, I'm sure you'll all give me the right answer. When is the best time to have quiet time? Pardon? Well, you're right. I just want to hear it a bit louder. When? Early morning. morning. Good. Do you know that from the Word of God? Let's go through some scriptures together. When should we... Well, first of all, before we go into the scriptures, when should we eat our largest meal? Do you know that from the Word of God? Oh, it went quiet then. (laughs) Okay. Question two. When did they have to gather the manna? Back in the Old Testament. In the morning. Before when? Before the sun waxed hot, Scripture tells us. And I like to think of that in terms of quiet time, that we need to have our quiet time before the day waxes hot. You know what I mean? (coughs) Things, the phone starts ringing and, you know, life starts speeding up. You know, Seven Testimonies, page 203, says this very short sentence. And it's, when you think about it, it has big implications. It says, the word of God is the true manna. They had to eat the manna every morning to survive. We have to eat the word of God every morning to survive. Next question, when did Abraham have his quiet time? It says in Genesis 19, 27, Abraham got up early in the morning. When did Jacob have his quiet time? Genesis 28, 18 says that Jacob rose up early in the morning. These are the great men we know, and the scripture tells us what they were doing. When did Moses get up? Genesis 34, 4 says, Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord as the Lord commanded him. When God wanted to meet with Moses, he says, be up here early. Is that just an interesting piece of scripture? Or has that got something to do with us? I believe it's got everything to do with us. What about Joshua? Joshua. When did he get up? Joshua 3, 1 tells us, and Joshua rose up early in the morning. When did David get up? It says, Oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh longeth for thee. Psalm 63, verse 1. We know a lot of the stories of Jesus teaching the people in the temple court. We think of a lot of the parables that we're familiar with, and they were taught at that time. But listen to this in Luke 21, 38. It says, And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. Where were they? They were in the temple courtyard or in the temple. When was it? Early in the morning. You know, Jesus is still meeting his people early in the morning. If you'd walked in Bible times, would you have been asleep? in the early morning hours and missed what was going on at the temple? What do you think? Well, you can know the answer for sure. How's it been this week? (laughs) Because Jesus has been out again, you know, looking for each one of us. Have we snoozed through it like the disciples in Gethsemane, or were we there? Did our Lord and Savior need to have any quiet time? Oh yes, the Bible's very clear. Probably the clearest scripture on that is Mark 1.35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out, departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. Solitary place. So did Jesus have his quiet time with everybody else? No. He went somewhere (coughs) quiet. You know, in our house, well, it's not so bad now, but In our house, the quiet time is before the children get up. That's like the sun waxing hot. You know, when the children get up, (laughs) quiet time disappears, especially when they're small. 
Thankfully, ours are joining in with us now. So, I bet there's some of you out there, and if I was in the congregation listening to this, this would be what would be going through my mind. That's all right for him to say, but I'm just not a morning person. Any, any people here who would willingly confess that they are not a morning person? Put your hand up. Oh, we've got a, a good group of us. Even some ladies. <laughs> I always thought it was always men that had to have a lie in, but... I think it, it, it's because I must have led him to think that. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're not a morning person, are you exempt? Well, how about if you say, well, I'm not a morning person, so I, I don't have morning time. How does that go with, well, I'm not a very patient person, so I yell at the kids. Is that okay? Or, I'm not a very studious person, so I can't read. Or, you know, I'm not a very forgiving person, so I have a bunch of enemies. No, that's not the God we serve. God can change us, can't he? Amen. God can change somebody who has an unforgiving spirit to a very forgiving person. God can change somebody who hasn't read a book all the way through to become a very studious person. I speak from experience. And God can change somebody who can't get up in the morning to somebody who can. Amen. I speak from personal experience. You know what I've learned? You know what the secret is of getting up in the morning? Going to bed at night. It's, 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 it's pretty basic, isn't it? But it's <laughs> took me... Took me about 30 years to figure that out. <laughs> You're doing good, sweetie. <laughs> you know, we need to guard that time of the day as if our life depends upon it. Because you know, it really does. Maybe not our physical life as we look at it, but our eternal life depends upon our connection with Jesus Christ in this world. And if we don't make one here, we aren't going to have them there. So it really does. You know, Exodus 16, 21, as they collected the manna, it said before the sun waxed hot. It must be the first thing that happens in our day. In our family, we have our morning devotions before we eat, before we have family worship, or before we do anything else. And you know why? Quite simply, because we have found you can't go through breakfast without the Lord. Not do you know what I mean? When there's just one slice of toast left and everybody wants it? You need the Lord, don't you? I mean, we're just being really basic, open, and frank. We need the Lord in every single aspect of our lives, starting with breakfast, or well, before. You know, I used to be a nurse, and so I know that there are some nurses here, and what about those of us, then, that work shift work? How does this morning time deal relate to those that are nurses? What about those that do night work, night shift? Does that mean they're exempt? Are they the people that fall into that exempt category? Well, your morning time, when you work those kind of odd hours, is when you get up, whenever that happens to be. I know when I used to do the night shift, I would go to bed at 8.30 in the morning and get up at about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon before I was married and had children. My morning time was 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Funny though it is, that was the beginning of my new day. And so that's when I needed to have that connection with the Lord. You know, sadly, I didn't know the Lord then as I do now, so I didn't do it. I just figured, well, hey, you know, how do you fit that in? And I just kind of let it go. It didn't do me any good, though. So whenever your day begins, whatever your lifestyle is that dictates that, is when you need that connection with heaven, with the Lord. Just calculate when you have to go to work, if you're a nurse or a shift worker, calculate when you have to be work and get up in time to make time for the Lord. It's not an excuse. You know, as we were giving this message in Oklahoma a couple of months ago, right in the middle of the message, a man starts walking up and he comes up and he, he gives us this piece of paper. I don't know if he thought we were going to read it. Oh, he, he, he wondered why I hadn't read it. And right. I said, well, we didn't kind of, there wasn't kind of time to really look at it first. <laughs> but it was very good. I'd like to read it to you now. It says, it's a little poem. Good morning, Lord. As soon as I brush my teeth, I'll study your word. Wow, look at that dirty mirror. As soon as I brush my teeth and clean the mirror, I'll study your word. Wow, is that my hair? As soon as I brush my teeth and clean the mirror and comb my hair, I'll study your word, Lord. Is that the phone? 
As soon as I brush my teeth and clean the mirror and comb my hair and answer the phone, I'll study your word, Lord. Is that you, Fido? Oh, Fido. As soon as I brush my teeth and clean the mirror and comb my hair and answer the phone and feed the dog, I'll study your word, Lord. Oh, look at the time. I'll be late for work. As soon as I come back from work today, Lord, I'll study your word. It's kind of a little bit amusing, but does it paint a real picture? Do we get so easily distracted? Do you check your email, check the weather on the web? You know, do you get distracted before you get into God's word? The devil has a hundred distractions, a thousand distractions waiting for us. That concludes when to have quiet time. When do we have quiet time? Early in the morning. Who needs quiet time? Well, we already answered that, really. The first text we looked at, Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone. Ladies, that (laughs) is the generic use of the term. Man shall not live by bread alone. That's mankind. That's you as well. (laughs) Think about the manna for a minute. Who needed to eat manna? The the adults? Did the children need to eat the manna? Did the young children need to eat the manna? Did the babies need to eat manna? Through mommy they did. You see the parallel? We all need quiet time. We need food, we need God's word. They're, They're inseparable. If Jesus needed quiet time, if Jesus Christ needed quiet time, we certainly do. With the flesh and the baggage that we carry around, we need it. Over the years, people have, many people have asked us, so what do you do with children in quiet time? And we figured, though, the best way to answer that, answer that is we'll just put it into a message and then it can be answered in one great foul swoop. <laughs> in fact, somebody yesterday asked me, what do you do with a six-year-old for morning devotions? And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) I said, you just need to come Sabbath afternoon, and my children are going to tell you what they do. So, but before they do, I'd just like to share what we did from when our children were somewhere between about 18 months and two years of age. We didn't go and wake them at that point for morning devotions, but if they would naturally wake, sometimes they would, earlier than was their normal waking time, We would just pop in a scripture song tape, or sometimes we would even put in the Bible on tape. And I would just pray, Lord, just let these things filter into their little minds. Let it go and do its work in their little hearts. And then as they got a little bit older, if they would wake, we'd give them maybe a Bible picture book or a nature picture book to look at whilst they listened to those scripture songs. Really, you know, were they going to remember any of that? 18 months old or two? Do you think they will? Probably not. But what we were doing was creating a habit in their lives so that as they get older, all they can ever remember is that they have their personal time with Jesus in the morning. And then they wouldn't think a dream of getting up and not having that time with him because it's become their habit. And so that's what we were doing. And you know, it may seem a little odd, but We feel so burdened to encourage you with your children, no matter what their ages are, to develop their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because time is very short, as we have said over and again. And the one thing that is going to carry us and our children into heaven is our connection personally with Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't expect a two-year-old to have the experience of a 20-year-old. But a two-year-old can know Jesus for themselves at the level that a two-year-old can understand. And so I really encourage you, now is the time to be training your little ones to have their own little relationship with Jesus Christ. And as they would get older, around about the age of four, when Hannah was about four and Caleb was two, we had a Bible storybook that Daddy would read to them as their personal devotion times because they couldn't read at that point. And so, as I was fixing breakfast, he would read these stories to them. And in fact, they would do two or three some days because they, three of them enjoyed it so much that they would try and do more and more until I'd have to say, you know, <laughs> time's up. <laughs> but they loved it, all three of them. It was just very precious. 
And then by the time Hannah turned six, and she was just beginning to read, and she would listen to those scripture songs, listen to the Bible, color a nature picture, or color something relevant to what she was listening to. And then she got to the point where she began to start to read for herself. And then I would take her to the 23rd Psalm, or other simple Bible passages that she could learn to read for herself. And you know, it meant so much to her that she could read it for herself. It was very precious for her. I'd like her to come up now, and she's going to share with you what she's doing at eight years old in her personal devotion times with the Lord. My quiet time. At 6.15, I get dressed and make my bed. At 6.30, I have my drink and my prayers. Mommy helped me make a prayer list. First of all, I give thanks for my night's rest, my parents, my brother, and my country home. Then I pray for myself. I pray I'm not okay with what to do, I'll be diligent in school, and I will choose not to argue. Then I pray for my family. I pray for Mommy and Daddy and Caleb and the grandparents coming soon. Then I pray for my special friends and for the special needs for the camp meetings. 6.40 to 7.15, I have my quiet time. Monday and Tuesday, I read Spirit of Prophecy. I have recently been reading Child Guidance, Chapter 21, called Industry. I like to read and, and underline things that are special to me. One thing I underlined was on page 126. Teach them to use their mind as much as possible, so to plan their work that they may do it quickly and thoroughly. Teach them to be prompt and energetic in their work, to economize time so that no minutes may be lost in their allotted hours of work. I underline this because it helps me to remember not to waste time in school. I have been doing double lessons in school, and now I've completed grade two, and I can enjoy the summer break. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I read my Bible. I enjoyed reading the whole books of Esther and Ruth in my quiet time. I learned how they were both godly women who chose Jesus in their different situations, even though one was rich and one was poor. It taught me that God is always with us. Some verses I underlined in my Bible are Ephesians 4.32. Would you like to turn there with me? And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. It helps me to remember to be kind and forgiving with my brother and also to have Jesus remind me during the day. I also underlined Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I underlined this so that it would help me to remember to, to obey and to make the right choice when I am tempted to disobey. In family worship, we are using the My Bible First lessons. I like to read the Bible chapter that we are doing for that week's lesson. Then I know what is going to be happening, and I will know the answers to Daddy's questions in family worship. <laughs> we are reading the book of Daniel just now in My Bible First, and I am enjoying reading it. Sabbath and Sunday, I listen in color. I like to listen to to the Bible, patriarchs and prophets, or child guidance on tape, and color a Bible or nature picture. Recently, I have listened to The Temptation of Jesus on Desire of Ages and colored the book about his temptation whilst I listened. It is helping me to choose not to eat too much at mealtime. I, I learned that the food temptation was the biggest temptation that Adam and Eve disobeyed from the beginning. I like to have my quiet time because I am learning things that help me to choose Jesus throughout the day. 
One time in my quiet time, I was just reading my underlinings and not really thinking about them. I had a really bad day, not doing well in school and choosing to waste time instead of listening to Jesus or my parents. At the end of the day, I realized it was because I had not chosen Jesus in my quiet time. We all, even boys and girls, need to have our quiet time so we can learn to follow Jesus every day. Thank you, Hannah. So what does it look like up here, Caleb? Look light. Really it's a, light. Lot, a lot of light. <laughs> yeah. F look like it faded. Yeah. So, are we going to talk about your quiet time a little bit? All right. What time do you get up to have your quiet time? Six fifteen. You do? Okay. And how do you wake up? Mommy or Daddy wake me up. All right. Do you like waking up at 6.15? Sometimes when we came back from camp, we took all to have a lie-in, but sometimes I do. <laughs> sometimes you like to have a lie-in when we come back from camp meeting. <laughs> yeah, I do as well. <laughs> My children just real. <laughs> but do you get up at 6.15 most of the time, would you say, or some of the time, or what do you think? Most of the time, not most, but sometimes we get our legs to early, but most of the time, yes. Most of the time, okay. We have no idea what he's going to say, so. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do before you start your quiet time? I have a prayer. Okay. Well, before you have a prayer, do you just roll out of bed and have a prayer, or...? No. What do you do? I make my bed, I have my drink. Go a bit slower and say your words clearly. I make my bed, I have my drink, I put my clothes on. Right. And I have my prayer. Good. It's good to get dressed, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what do you pray about? I'll pray that I'll be good and that I'll be good at flight school and... Mommy and Daddy will be good, and, uh, and a grandparent will be good. And do your prayer get answered, do you think? Are Mommy and Daddy good to you, or...? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? <laughs> He's lost his voice. He's <laughs> got my problem. <laughs> you pray for anything else? There's only in the nose, Daddy. There's only in the nose. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on. What do you do in your quiet time? After you've, after you've got up and you got dressed and you've had your drink and all of that and you've had your prayer, then what do you do? I have my quiet time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what do you do in your quiet time? I listen to... Oh. Ten Commandments. Okay, you listen to the Ten Commandments, and that looks like a book. How, how do you listen to a book? I listen to a tape of the same book. Okay, there's a tape that goes with the book. Okay, so you look at the book, is that right, and listen to the tape? Yes. Okay, what did you learn from that as you listened to it? Because I know you listened to it quite a few times. I, I shouldn't steal, because I... We shouldn't have other gods, and I need to obey mommy and daddy. Amen. Amen. Did you, did you learn anything else from it? What about the stealing thing? Uh, and I shouldn't, and we shouldn't steal. I already said that, daddy. Yeah, you did already say that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so what are the tapes do you listen to, Caleb? I listen to Isaiah 53. Okay. <laughs> what did you learn from Isaiah 53? That Jesus died on the cross for us to be saved. Yes, he did. That's very precious, Caleb. That's very precious. So, what do you do 
whilst you're listening, well, let me ask the next question. Is that all the tapes that you listen to? Or is there something else that you listen to as well? No. Um, treasure from God Word. Say it again. Treasure from God Word. And, and what's that all about? That is... They sing scripted songs and... A lady speaks from a Bible. Scripture songs and a lady talking about the Bible. And do you yes. enjoy it? Yeah. Have you learned a lot from that? Yes. Yes, I know you have a great deal. So, anything else you listen to? This is his current favourite. Cortel Power will be on the back table after the shower. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, he's his father's son. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put him up to it. <laughs> Although he, he's his daddy's number one fan, and he loves to listen to daddy, so that's what he does. So what, what are your hands doing? As you're listening to this, I know you've got your headphones on and you're looking at the book, but what, what do you do with your hands? I draw a picture. I want to draw the picture of... When? I don't know, you tell me. Yeah. You drew a picture about Elijah one day, you remember that? I drew a picture about Elijah standing on a mountain and telling his servant to go out and see if there was a cloud in the sky. Right, and that was because that's what you were listening to. Is that right? I can't remember. I think <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was, Caleb, I remember very well. <laughs> So do you plan to have quiet time your whole life? I mean, you're only six now. You think you'll do it for a while and then maybe give up later on, or? No. No? You're going to do it your whole life, every morning? Yes. Why would you want to do that? <coughs> it helped me through the day. It, it does? Amen. Thank you, son. You know, Proverbs 8 Thank you, children. And verse 17 says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. I encourage you, parents, spend some time in, in giving your children the habit, the opportunity to develop a relationship with Jesus at their tender age. And that verse says, seek me early. If you're not a child anymore, then you can't apply that to early in life. There's only one way you can apply that verse, early in the morning. So, what is the purpose of quiet time? We've looked at when to have quiet time and who needs quiet time. Now we're going to look at what is the purpose of quiet time. Simply put, it's to be like Jesus. But what does that really mean? What does that practically mean? To me, that means, as I was sharing last night, it means to connect with Jesus Christ. You know the difference. I'm sure you know the difference. When your quiet time has not ended at the prayer. You know, you have your quiet time, you say amen, and that kind of seals it off, and then you just go into the day. Real quiet time, the purpose of real quiet time for me is that that quiet time, that time in God's Word, that time in prayer, that time in contemplation, goes with us. And we have a connection with Jesus Christ. We hear His voice. We are reminded of His principles through the day. That is the purpose of quiet time. And if we do that one day at a time, one day at a time, then our days are changed, and our weeks are changed, and our lives are changed, one day at a time. The purpose of quiet time is to plug into God, to plug into his power, to gain a communication channel with him that can be kept open through the day. Started through his word, and then obviously we can't be in his word all the day long, but God can bring back his words to us through his still, small voice, prompting us and guiding us through the day. You know, I used to think that quiet time was a little bit like a rechargeable battery. 
you kind of plugged in in the morning time and then you disconnected from God and off you went with your rechargeable battery that went dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and if all went well you managed to get into bed before your light went out and you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning and you get charged back up and you know on a particularly bad day your light went out and you know because you didn't get a good enough charge it's not like that that is not that has some truth in it but it has a lot of error in it as well what we need i don't know if any of you here use the internet i'm sure you do there's two basic ways you can connect to the internet there's dial up and there's dsl okay a cable as well but with dial up you you're disconnected most of the time because it's not running up the phone bill and then when you want to connect you know you press connect and it goes beep beep boop boop beep beep you've all heard the sound yeah i can't do it very good but you know you know what i mean and then you wait a quite a while sometimes and then eventually you're there you're connected and you do what you've got to do and what do you do when you're finished you disconnect and then you're disconnected that's not the christian walk we don't just plug into god when we need him and then disconnect it needs to be a constant connection and that's what dsl is for those of you who don't know you, there's no beep 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 boo, boo, anymore it's a constant connection you just open up your browser and the internet is there and that's what it needs to be like with jesus christ that we open up our hearts and he's already there we haven't got to go through the connection process it's a constant connection that is for me the purpose of my quiet time to open up that connection and stay with him all the day through then if we have that connection with him we can take that theme with us throughout the day and it can become very real to us and in our different situations, we then have that connection with the Lord that's real in our lives that can affect how we respond in those given situations. You know, if we are reading, we will not be wavering. Amen. Think about that for a minute. If you are reading, you will not be wavering, providing you're reading the inspired word of God and the inspired writings that are there available for us. When you're reading those, you have an anchor. And so when the different things come through your day and you're tempted to wonder, well, should I really be doing this instead of this? And other people say, well, why do you raise your children that way? And they kind of cast questions in your mind about what you're doing. If you're reading, you'll have no question about it. You'll know for sure the firm word of God as to why you should be doing what you're doing. As we've said, listening here brings conviction, and that's important but it needs to become your own experience, and it will do that as you spend that time with the Lord. We stayed with the Barcelo family uh, back in February doing some meetings in their church, and they introduced us, they shared it the other day, the lovely idea of bef after you've had your personal worship time and you come to your family worship time to share what you learned personally. Try it. It, it has been very helpful in our home. So we all gather around the, the fireplace, the, the wood stove, in the morning, and I'll say to the children, so what did you learn in your quiet time? And they open up and they tell us, how does that practically apply? And then my wife will chip in and I will say what I learned. It has a twofold effect. You get to know where everybody in the family is spiritually. You get to find out who's coasting, who's drifting. You get to find out where they are so you can help each other through the day try that it, is, it gives a degree of accountability as well we're going to get to worship and I've, I've wasted my time i better get in here and find something for my day try it it's worked wonders for us so let's move on how and what to study this is our point number four this is our closing point or our last point i should say you know we have got to make our study of god's word practical if it's just theory if it just clogs up our head you'll just end up with a headache and a heartache it's got to make that little journey 18 inches from our mind to our heart we've got to look into those bible stories and, and get get out of it what will help us that day you know we've looked a little bit at the manna who gave the manna who needed to eat the manna did it take effort to collect the manna parallel this with your own quiet time you know did they have to eat it did it have to actually get inside them then did their bodies have to digest it 
Did it have to become part of them? Yes. They were made up of it in the end. You know, what would it have been like in the times of old if they'd all kind of stood around and said, oh, this manor's great. We got loads of it outside our tent. And yeah, we got, and do you know you can do this with it and that with it and the other with it? And it's, yeah, if they talked about it all day and never ate it, they would starve to death. And I fear many of us are doing the same thing. It's got to be a part of us. We've got to pull the practical principles out of God's word and bring them into our daily life. That is the purpose of quiet time, not just to gather knowledge. We're going to look at the verse-by-verse method, the topical search, and the big picture very quickly. The verse-by-verse method, we're told in Education 189, I'm just going to summarize that, that we need to look at a verse at a time until it becomes our own experience. Don't feel like you've got to read whole chapters a day and you haven't had your time with the Lord unless you do that. It can be half a verse, but if it becomes your own experience through the day, it was more significant than a great piece of, a piece of the Bible would have been. You can then make that your theme throughout the day. Now, the topical search is something that I like to do. As I shared yesterday, I searched out the topic of patience. You can go just to the back of your Bible, maybe, to the concordance there, and just look up all the verses on patience. And then maybe if you've got, you know, Ellen White Index or the Ellen White CD or something, you can go in there and you can go down through all the references to a certain word. And, you know, we like to make this really practical. And some people have come to me and said, you mean I can study about child rearing in my devotion times? Absolutely. If you're a mother with young children, there's probably nothing more important that you need to spend your time in with God in the morning than learning how to be the best mother you can be. So yeah, it needs to be very practical. I spend a lot of time studying association and all these other topics that come up when you're, when you're a parent. So those are things that you can do. And you know, you have a lot of enthusiasm when it starts to become real in your life and you see the changes that your learning is making in your life. As you study, have you got the tools to study God's Word? I mean, you can just open up God's Word and say, Lord, please lead me to a, a, a nice reading today. I've done that on occasions. But, you know, how would that be if a school teacher came into the class and said, oh, yes, we're doing algebra today? It's got to be a little bit more structure to it. And so avail yourself of the tools that are available. Get a concordance. If you want to study a subject, you can look up something and then you can go through every biblical reference on that subject. Maybe if, I mean, I personally don't use a a concordance now, a a book concordance, because the computer does it so much better. You can put two words in there and you can look it up. So get yourself a concordance. If you have access to the internet, there is a a program that you can download from esword.net esword.net. There you can download all the Bible study tools you need. You can download the Greek and the Hebrew and the lexicon and everything you need, totally free of charge. And then it's on your computer. You don't have to be connected to the internet thereafter. You can study out words. You can study out subjects. You can cut and paste all kinds of stuff. A very easy way to find your way around the scriptures There's also another website, BibleGateway.com. That has virtually every Bible translation. So if you look at a verse, and you don't quite get the the depth or the meaning of it, you can look at it in a different version, and a different version, and a different version. And by the time you've listened to all those, and you've gone back to...